Good evening. This is your obedient servant, Orson Welles. With his 1946 Broadway musical Around the World, Orson Welles, the creative mind behind the infamous War of the Worlds broadcast and Citizen Kane, once again exploded artistic norms. This time, however, he did not send a wave of terror through the press, nor did he revolutionize cinematography and nonlinear storytelling. Instead, though all but forgotten today, in Around the World, Welles challenged the ostensible distinctions between film and theater by creating multimedia magic tricks. Though the sequences Welles shot for the production are lost, the research that originated at the University of Michigan Special Collections Library in 2013, I reconstructed the missing sequences and the effects Wells created with them in conjunction with live performance. To accomplish this, I used a wide range of archival material that I collected from repositories from around the world, including scripts, shot lists, critical reviews, correspondences, and countless visual materials. However, although the hundreds of production photographs, set renderings, costume designs, and programs capture many of the production's elaborately beautiful spectacles, the only surviving visual evidence related to the film sequences include a single frame of the film and one on-set production photograph. Despite this lack of visual evidence, the written materials revealed that many of the sequences combined film and theater together so that both media interacted and depended on each other to function. So what happens on the screen appears to affect what happens on the stage and vice versa. In one remarkable example, Wells even made the live action on stage cinematic by creating an illusion that the film sequences were being projected not onto the screen, but onto the entire stage. However, the sequence I am describing, or any of the other sequences for that matter, hardly seems remarkable when described in written form. And in many ways, writing is an extremely inadequate way to present this type of research. Not simply because writing strips the sequence of its visual spectacle, but more practically because on paper their descriptions read awkwardly and convolutedly. The written form also strips humanity scholars of the ability to achieve what I believe is a unique objective of our work, to capture and display human experiences. As a result, in an attempt to clarify the data of my research, provide viewers with the opportunity to watch a zany sequence from around the world, and to provide the detective-like experience of archival research, I created the following visualization. <laughs> With the light slightly dimmed, the Hyde Park scene opened with the movie screen placed in front of a painted backdrop. This backdrop, located downstage, depicted the exterior of a London street. A single bush was also placed stage right. The film opened on the Hyde Park set. In the film, the bank robber ran from a group of bobbies and hid behind the bush on screen, which was placed in the exact same location as the bush on stage. Meanwhile on screen, Molly came into Hyde Park pushing a baby carriage. As she did this on screen, Molly physically appeared on stage just as an on-screen inner title introduced her as Molly, an honest nursemaid from the old sod. When the on-screen Molly stopped the carriage and went to smell a branch on the bush, the on-stage Molly matched her action with the bush on stage. On screen, Molly caught the attention of Pat, who was also on screen, lying in the nearby grass. As he got up to pursue her on screen, Pat physically appeared on stage. At the same time, an on screen intertitle introduced him as Pat Passepartout, a strolling pair from America. Suddenly, the robber physically entered from stage left and darted across the stage into the stage right portal, which appeared to cause the robber to reappear in the film. The robber on screen then moved from his hiding place behind the bush to one behind Molly's baby carriage. In an act of desperation, the robber reached into the carriage and concealed the money inside. As this happened, the onstage Molly and Pat watched the actions of the robber, and possibly themselves, on screen. Suspecting the robber had stolen something from the carriage or kidnapped the baby, Pat, followed closely by Molly, rushed through the lower right portal in a fit of anger. Appearing on the film, Pat began a slapstick fight with the robber. Suddenly, the film ended and the London drop and the screen were removed revealing Pat and the robber fighting on stage on the Hyde Park set. At the same time, an antique theatrical device called a lobster scope covered the stage in a flickering light, which continued until Pat chased the robber off stage. In contrast to reading my written description line by line, the visualization allows viewers to comprehend the sets of data simultaneously 
over a period of time, and in constant relation to each other. Viewers always know when characters are on stage, off stage, or on screen, and what their spatial relationship to each other is. They also understand the magical spatial and temporal connections between the portals, the stage, and the screen. Just as importantly, the visualization is crafted almost entirely from actual archival materials. When conducting the research, I saw around the world coming to life through the archival evidence like a detective mapping out a crime scene. I attempted to recreate my experience by composing the entire project using production photographs, set designs, and programs. The resulting cartoon aesthetic also matches the outlandish, quirky scenarios, songs, and decor of around the world. A production in which film sequences share the stage with toy trains, a circus, a magic show, paper mache elephants, and even a giant eagle. Though my project began as a way to overcome the limitations of written scholarship, in the process I discovered that this type of project can have other types of real-life impacts. My project was only possible because of the growing institutional support coming out of the digital humanities movement. As a result, now more than ever, there is a push to make archival material just as open to creative applications as it is to making scholarship open to stylistic flourishes. The wall separating artistic practitioners and scholars has the potential to collapse, and I hope my project will encourage others to forcefully break it down with me. Look, look, look what I found.